Welcome to this video on Java interfaces. Now in this video, we're going to go through lots and lots of detail about the mechanics of Java interfaces, what you can and cannot do. But once we've covered that, we're going to go on to more interesting topics, which I believe will help you add a lot more value to your projects, which is where you start talking about design considerations for interfaces and how you can use them in your code in a kind of elegant and efficient way. And Bear in mind that there's been lots of changes to interfaces in recent releases. So we are going to go through a lot of those kind of things and see how they impact how you would use interfaces from a design perspective. So let's get started. All right, folks, quick pause here just to let you know that later on in the video, there is a little surprise. If you get to it and you find the surprise, make sure you leave a comment in the comment section below to let me know what you thought. And that's it. Let's get back to the video. All right, so let's just have a quick look at some of the stuff we're going to cover in this presentation. But before I do that, just to let you know that the timestamps are in the description below. So if you want to skip to a particular section, you can do that. We are going to cover a quick introduction to interfaces. We're going to look at interface basics, default methods, visibility, attributes, usage, naming, implementing interfaces. We're going to look at what interfaces can hold, where interfaces can live, design considerations. And that section, in my opinion, is probably the most important thing of the whole presentation. So don't skip that. Why not just use abstract classes instead of interfaces, functional interfaces, annotations, and then we're going to have a quick wrap up at the end. All right, finally, we are looking at some code. So along the left, you can see different sections of code that I have. These are just a bunch of classes which I use to hold my notes and hold the examples of code. I will include a link to GitHub so that you can follow along with this code if you want to or get access to it later. All right, so the fundamental question is, what is an interface? An interface is a class-like structure. It's denoted with the interface keyword. So let's just have a look at a quick example. So this is a top level interface and you can see public interface and we've just got a silly name there that's not very useful. And this interface doesn't have anything in it, which again means that it's not massively useful, but we'll look at better examples as we go along. Now it's denoted by the keyword interface. So that would be class if this was a class, otherwise it's interface. Now, if you look at the icon here, you can just about see that that shows you that it says I for interface. So the IDE can usually color those kind of things or code them with an icon. All right, so they're called interfaces because implementers, which are normally classes that implement interfaces, they promise to abide by the given contract the given interface contract. That means all the methods declared in the interface, they promise to provide those methods, otherwise the code won't compile. Now, when these interfaces are passed around, so for example, a method that you call returns some interface like list, the implementation, which actual list implementation you're using might not be obvious to the calling clients. So let's imagine, for example, you have a method that returns an information source or info source to a client. Now, under the hood, if that's an interface, you might have implemented that as one day with DB info source. OK, getting information from a database. On another day, you might change that to file information source because you're having troubles with your database for whatever reason. So the point is that the client will call info source and say something like get the information I need. But under the hood, on one day, you might be returning a DB info source and you'll get the information from a database. On another day, you'll get it from file info source and you'll fetch the information from a file source. Now, the calling client doesn't really care. The calling client might not even be aware that you've changed the implementation, but because you're abiding by the interface, you can go ahead and do that. So another quick example, we've got a class here called dog and we've got an interface here called animal. And the only difference here is that one says class and one says interface. Now, interfaces, as I mentioned earlier, are usually implemented by classes, but they don't have to be. You could just have an interface on its own that never really gets implemented by anything. And another quick point is that a class, for example, cat can implement multiple interfaces. And that's one of the big advantages of interfaces versus abstract classes. So in this example, we've got class cat, which implements animal and feline. So it promises to be an animal and it promises to be a feline or have the functionality of an animal and a feline. Now, in this case, Animal doesn't declare any functionality or methods and feline doesn't declare any functionality or methods. So these are what you could consider marker interfaces and we'll go into what those are in a little while. But in the meantime, both of these feline and animal don't really offer any functionality, but it's just for demonstration that you can implement multiple interfaces. Now, another thing to note is that interfaces for example, Big Cat can extend other interfaces. Big Cat here is extending feline and animal. So Big Cat is a feline and Big Cat is an animal. Okay, or Big Cat has the functionality of a feline and has the functionality of an animal. Now, again, Big Cat doesn't declare any methods and feline and animal don't declare any methods. So most of this is pretty useless other than for demonstration purposes. One thing to note is that interfaces are inherently static, but that just means that they don't relate to any instance. Okay, so that's just a different way to think about interfaces. It's not particularly important to remember that for the purposes of actually using interfaces, but I find it quite helpful to think of them as static. 
Okay, in this section, we are going to go through some more of the basics of interfaces. So let's get into it. So interfaces can be used as marker interfaces. Now, when we say marker interfaces, that just means that they don't define any behavior. So there's nothing in the curly braces here, but they indicate that something is something. So for example, you could have a cat that could implement animal, and it's just a marker interface to say that a cat is an animal. Now, why would you do this? Well, they allow us to signal a trait to other developers. You might have some behavior that you've mandated that every class that implements one of these interfaces must adhere to some other external behavior that's not actually mandated in the interface itself. The JVM and compiler can look at an object at runtime and know whether it is an animal or not. So you might use that for some kind of reflection based checking. Now a real life example in Java of a marker interface is serializable. Serializable objects are objects that can be kind of squished down and sent down the wire. If your object is such an object, you can implement serializable to indicate that as a marker interface. Right, so interfaces in general can represent some trait or characteristic or nature. They can incorporate some prescribed ability, but not how to carry out that ability. So for example, here we have a vehicle interface, which has the ability to drive. So anything that implements the vehicle interface must provide the ability to drive the actual implementation. But in the interface, this is just an abstract method with no ability actually defined. So we're not actually defining how to drive. We don't even know what it is. Is it a boat? Is it a car? Is it a motorbike? We don't know what drive means in this case. We just know that anything that implements this will have the ability to drive. But the implementation is left down to the implementing classes. Another example is more of a, so we could say this one is a nature, but this one is more of a trait, something that it can do, an ability. And so we can say this interface, anything that implements this interface can in fact jump and it must define a jump method with an implementation. Again, notice that the method represents an ability, but not how, because there's no actual implementation here. There's no curly braces with the details of how to jump. So a kangaroo might jump differently to a basketball player, to a frog. Now, these methods are abstract by default. You don't need to say abstract, they're just abstract. They've got no actual implementation, hence they're not concrete, i.e. they are abstract, and they need to be implemented by an implementing class. Okay, so a trait can be more explicit or less explicit, and it could describe some characteristic of the implementation. So for example, you could have something called requires admin access. So you could have some kind of permission based system and certain abilities, I guess. And then certain abilities, if they're implemented by classes, they could implement requires admin access, which is a marker interface, which indicates that that particular ability requires admin access. Okay. So that's one way of building up your object class type hierarchy to indicate what each thing can actually do. Another one is has connection. So for example, you might have a database connection, you might have a connection to some kind of object store or something like that. And they all say require a connection. So it could implement has connection. Now in real life, you'd probably not have these as marker interfaces and you might have have open closed methods or checkability method or something like that. We have methods defined on here. But for the sake of our example about traits, we can just use these as a simple example with no implementation. Okay, so interfaces tend to incorporate some prescribed behavior, not including how. However, now we can actually include how with a technique using the default keyword. When we declare methods with the default keyword, we have to be aware that these are instance methods. So anything that implements, say, air vehicle, a class that implements air vehicle, say helicopter, would inherit the fly method. And this method is actually on an instance. It's not like a static method, even though we said interfaces are kind of inherently static. The fly method is actually going to be a available on instances of helicopter. So if you say helicopter h equals new helicopter, you could say h.fly should be helicopter.fly, which would call this method here. So these methods are instance methods. They are inherited. They cannot be private, but they can be overridden. So another way of saying it is exactly as the keyword defines, it's a default implementation. It doesn't mean you have to stick with that. Okay. And the other reason why static methods won't do is because they cannot access instance methods. Whereas if you notice these default methods, they can go ahead and call abstract instance methods that will be implemented. So these have got access to static methods as well as instance methods, whereas static methods don't have access to instance methods. Okay. And here we've got an example of a private method used to deduplicate a static method. So we've got a static method here called print names, and you've got another one here called print number, and they both just want to print something. There's no point duplicating that print functionality. So you create a private static method method and they can both just call that. 
All right, so let's talk about static methods in interfaces. Now, static methods are now allowed in interfaces. They generally incorporate some utility function. They reduce the need for utility classes holding only static methods. So you often get the case where you had a class or an interface, and then you had a utility class to accompany it with all the utility functions, the static functions that you'd have in there. Now, what's the difference between static and default methods? Well, default methods can only be called via an instance, i.e. an implementing class. They can't just be called without having an implementing class. Static methods, on the other hand, can be called at any time. As we mentioned already, that static methods usually imply some utility function, such as add two numbers together, append two strings, something like that. And they would normally be or ideally be deterministic, which means that every time you give them a particular set of inputs, you always get a particular output and they can be private and public. And you can see an example here of an add method, which is a static interface add method. And it's deterministic. It's just going to add two numbers together and return the addition of the two numbers. All right, now let's have a look at method attributes. So here we've got an example of a method in an interface called car, and the method is simply drive. Now this is an abstract interface method, the typical that you're used to seeing. Now notice here that we have public and it's grayed out by the ID. That's because it's the default and you don't actually need to put it there. We've got abstract, but again, it's the default. We don't need to put it there. Abstract just means that there's no implementation, which means that you have to actually provide a concrete implementation. If you implement car, so if you create a implementation called Audi or BMW or whatever, they would have to actually implement this drive method. So public abstract is not required. And you cannot combine final with abstract because final implies that you can't actually extend it or override it or implement it. You need to do that in order to actually provide the implementation. So you can't combine final with abstract. So let's look at a quick example here. Yeah, you see that you get some nice error messages illegal combination and it doesn't make sense anyway. So just to recap this section, we've seen that interfaces can contain abstract methods. They can contain static methods. They can contain constants. I'm not sure I did demonstrate that, but let's just stick a constant in here. Let's say public static file int error code. And just do that. So that's an example of a constant. You can have default methods, which we've seen. And when you implement an interface, you must implement all of the abstract methods, but abstract classes don't need to. So if you have an abstract class that implements an interface, that does not need to implement all methods. But any concrete class that you create will need to implement all of them. And finally, in this section, interface names can be used in the same way as class types can be used in your code. So the same way you might have BMW B equals new BMW, you could say car C equals new BMW, and you can do all that kind of stuff. So you can use this, these names in your code as you would classes. All right, folks, earlier in the video, I promised you a little surprise later on in the video. Well, now it is later on in the video and here's the surprise. So it's a little poem about, written about interfaces. I hope you don't cringe too hard. Definitely let me know in the comments what you think of the poem. Here goes. Interface in your face, not concrete like a class, more abstract like a farce, no state like an abstract class, but default methods solid like grass. Remember, it's not a rat race. You always have up your sleeve that little ace, my lovely, lovely interface, a massive interface in your face. An interface in outer space is an outer face. The more the merrier, like a Yorkshire Terrier. Once you learn about interface features, you become habitual creatures, a giant interface in your face the end. All right, that's enough of that. Hopefully you didn't cringe too hard. Definitely let me know in the comments below what you thought of my poem or whether you think I should just stick to the day job and carry on coding or pursue a career in poetry. Right now, let's get back to the video. Okay, in this section, we are going to talk about default methods. Now, we've already seen default methods, but let's have a little recap and go into some more detail. And let's just have a think about why we have interfaces. If you are designing a library or you're building an API or something like that, you may well have interfaces that define core types. But how those types get implemented, you might not necessarily have control over. So the library users and the framework users and the API users, all that kind of stuff, they might extend your interfaces in ways that you hadn't thought of, right? They might implement them and use them in ways that you hadn't quite anticipated. But fundamentally, you can control certain aspects of it via the interface. But if you add methods to your interface, you'll break source compatibility. So let's just look at a quick example. If we take something that's in the JDK itself, and let's say list, 
Now, if you look at the list interface, you can see that we've got a size method. We've got an is empty method. Now, if I just went ahead and I can't actually type here, but if I went ahead and added a method here called calculate values here, abstract method, just like these ones, okay, without a body, what that would do is that would break every implementation of the list interface. And remember, there may be thousands of implementations depending on how big your library is. Maybe you're building a core framework project for your entire organization, and there might be hundreds of microservices using that. Every time they update, to your new version of list, they will see that that new method is there and their code will stop compiling. Okay, that's called breaking source compatibility, which is a bad thing. And because all the implementing code will no longer compile, everybody will be really annoyed with you and they'll be really upset that they've got to do extra work when all they did was update a dependency to your library. Because of this, library designers are hesitant to evolve their interfaces, evolve the design of their interfaces, because they know that the pain that that can cause to users of that interface. But there's a way around it now with default methods and default methods, as the name suggests, provide a default implementation. They don't break implementers because what they do is you, for example, provide a default method. You can see an example. Let's just get rid of this quickly. You can see an example here, a method X. I mean, there's nothing in it. That's just because I'm lazy, but there could easily be something in there say something like a print statement, but let's just get rid of that for simplicity. Now you provide a default implementation of the X method. Now, anybody that implements the A interface can override this, but they don't have to because they already have a default implementation. And if they're happy with that, then they're good to go. So as I said earlier, you effectively provide a default implementation. So implementers do not have to worry. Now there can be issues with resolution. So you've got an example here, you've got interface A and interface B, and both of them have got the X method and method is exactly the same, which means that if you implement A and B in one class. Remember, classes can implement multiple interfaces. That's one of the big advantages of interfaces over abstract classes. Then you get this conflict resolution problem. If at any point you call method X or uh, you want to access method X, well, which one are you accessing? Are you accessing this one or this one? How does that conflict get resolved? Okay, so we'll come on to that shortly. Okay, now the other thing is that having default methods effectively allows you to have multiple inheritance. So before default methods, interfaces couldn't have any kind of implementation information. They just had abstract methods like you saw in the list interface that we saw earlier. So a class picks up the definition of those methods, but has to actually implement them themselves. It doesn't really inherit any low level behavior. But because now you can provide default methods and a class can implement A and B, i.e. multiple interfaces, it can effectively get multiple inheritance, but not state. Remember, interfaces do not have state, unlike abstract classes. So you effectively get multiple inheritance now in Java using interfaces with default methods, but without state. So they remove the need for implementers to have empty methods. Now, sometimes you get a scenario where you've got, say, a method X and X might not apply to all of the implementers of interface A. So for example, you might have a animal interface, which has got a fly method. But if your animal that you've implemented is a giraffe, giraffes don't fly, that might be empty. Now, providing a default method obviously gets rid of that because you've provided a method in the interface level. So the implementer, the giraffe in this case, wouldn't need to implement the fly method because it's in the interface. But when you get scenarios like that where you might have a method that you don't implement or methods that are not applicable. Sometimes to me that looks like a design problem, so it might be worth just reconsidering that. Okay, so let's look at an example here. We, as I said earlier, we've got an interface A, which has a default method X. Don't be confused by the fact that it's on one line. That's just to save space and to make it a bit easier to comprehend. And then we've got an interface B, which is basically identical to A in that it's just got one method, which is a default method called X. I haven't put anything in the implementation, but these are not abstract methods. They're very real. They're concrete methods. Okay, they just don't do anything because I'm trying to keep the example simple. Now let's create a class that implements both A and B and see what happens. Oh dear, you get an error message. Let's just have a look at that. Blah, 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 blah. Inherits unrelated default methods for X from types this and types that, right? So basically what it's saying is that, look, you're inheriting a method X from interface A and you're inheriting a method X from interface B. So which one is the one that's applicable here? You get a problem. So what we can do simply to get around that is to go ahead and implement the method. And if we say public void X and Let's just do the same thing to keep it simple, not put anything in there. You can see that that solves the problem because it's now no longer relying on the two default methods that it was confused about. It doesn't know which one to call and it's got its own implementation. So we've solved that problem. Now, what if we actually are interested in the behavior of this particular X or this particular X and we really want that functionality? What do we do? Well, you have this syntax. So if I show you here now, we've got class X, which implements A and B, just like class Z. But this time around, we've overridden the method. So we've created our X method, which deals with the 
conflict problem, but we actually go ahead and delegate the work to method X. Because imagine there's a ton of functionality in here, say 100 lines of code, and you don't want to repeat that in here. And actually all of the code in there is relevant and applicable, but you're not interested in the one that's in B. You can just say A dot super dot X. So you build this method here to deal with the conflict problem. So class X knows that whenever the X method is called, it's this method here that it's going to call. But you really don't want to duplicate the behavior. So you say A dot super dot X. So that deals with that. Now, where you have multiple interfaces with multiple methods and you have overridden methods and there's all kind of combination of methods that you can have to understand which one's going to get called, which actual method in the end is going to get called. There's something called resolution rules. Now, we won't go through all of them because probably won't be a common use case, a common scenario where you're dealing with this. But it is important to be aware so that in your scenario, you don't take them for granted that you know which method is going to be called. You just have a think about it at the time. But we will look at some examples. So let's take a look at this interface here. We've got an interface called U with a default method B. Pretty straightforward. I think this semicolon isn't actually necessary. Let's just get rid of that. And we've got a class called UC, which implements U. Okay, so this class here implements this interface here. Now in here, we've got a method A, which calls method B. And if I just click on that, that's going to call this method here pretty much as you would expect. All good so far. Then let's take a look at another example where we've got an interface V and a V also has a default method B. And again, we'll just get rid of that semicolon and do that. So this interface is basically identical to this one. It's got a method that is the same. And now if we go ahead and create a class that implements that, we end up with a scenario where we get an error message because we've got a class called UD, which implements U and V, which is this one and this one. And we've got a conflict similar to the conflict we saw earlier up here somewhere, similar to this conflict where we ended up overriding that method. So let's just take a quick look at the error message. And it's basically the same error message that we saw earlier, which says something along the lines of something inherits unrelated defaults for B from types, blah, blah, blah. It means that it's inheriting B from here and inheriting B from here. And it doesn't know which one to call when we're invoking it here. So we are then forced to implement it. Okay. And the same, in this case, the same scenario applies. You would have to implement this B method to then deal with it. And then you're delegate the work to maybe this B or this B, whichever one you're interested in, or implement completely your own one. Okay. So that scenario gives you a conflict. Okay. The next scenario we're going to look at is where we've overridden the B default method in a different interface, right? So here we've got an interface U, if I click on that again, so maybe this is getting a bit hard to follow, but I'll try and simplify it. So we've got an interface U, which has a default method B, all good. But we come along here and we decide that we're going to extend that interface. So remember, if you've got an interface, another interface can come along and extend that interface, which means that it will get all of the methods that were on the original interface. Plus, you can add more methods to it. Now, you had a default method called B, but now we're creating an abstract method called B in the interface W. So now when we go ahead and implement W, but we also implement V, we're going to effectively get W, U and V all together effectively. OK, so let's see what happens when we do that. So when we do that, we get an error message saying, let's see what it says. So we seem to get it twice. Class UE must either declare abstract or implement abstract method B in W. So what that means is that it didn't get the B method from here, the default method, and it didn't get the B method from U. It got the B method from this interface, which is abstract because this is lower down the chain. So this effectively overrides the method in U or V. OK, it doesn't really matter. And therefore, that means that we have to implement that method. So in this scenario, we can simply just use the tool to help us implement these methods. And we just do that and that. And there we have an implementation. So now it knows what to do. This method is effectively overriding this one. And then if we want to, we can go ahead and call the B method in U or the B method in V, however we want to, using this funky syntax that I showed you earlier, which is this one here, a.super.x. All right, so in this section, we are going to look at interface visibility. So visibility just refers to the kind of access modifiers you have on interfaces and things inside interfaces and nested interfaces and that kind of thing. Okay, so let's get into it. So top level interfaces, and by top level, I mean that when you have a file like this, uh, where are we? Let's click on that one. When you have a file like this, the thing at the very top level that's not encased by anything else is considered to be the top level interface or abstract class or whatever it is. So top level interfaces must be public or default. So public is this and default is this. That means they can't be things like protected. 
They can't be final or anything like that. They can just be public or default. So let's change that back to public. Okay, so nested interfaces, on the other hand, are public by default. So firstly, what are nested interfaces? Nested interfaces are simply interfaces that live inside an interface or inside a class. So interfaces don't have to be declared at the top level of a file like this one is. They can be declared inside a existing interface or abstract class or class, in which case they are nested interfaces like this one here. So A is a nested interface. And nested interfaces are static by default. So you can see the IDE has grayed out static because it's basically redundant because it's static by default. And they are public by default, which is also why public is grayed out. Now, you don't need to put them in. I've just put them in here to demonstrate that to you. And they can't have any other modifiers. So we can't say protected. Oops, get rid of that. You get an error message. You can't say final. You get an error message. Okay, so now an interesting quirk is that protected visibility is not allowed in interfaces. It's deemed to offer little value, but for a bunch of extra added complexity at a language and usage level. So you can't do things like this, which is inside your nested interface in this case, but it could be any interface. You can't have a protected variable. And if you're interested in knowing more about why protected isn't allowed inside interfaces, you can read more about it on Stack Overflow. There's tons of stuff written about it there. All right, so let's just quickly go through the difference between protected and default. So default is, let's just give an example here. So this is default. Default just means no access modifier. You still effectively are setting the access of the interface or whatever it is. When you remove the access modifier, it becomes default, sometimes known as package private, but it has a meaning. So you still have a visibility. You've defined a visibility by removing the access modifier and it means certain things. So we'll go through that in a second. So protected, on the other hand, is where you write protected and that's another type of access modifier and that means something different again. So let's just go back down to the bottom and go through what the difference is. So the difference is really all about what subclasses in other packages can access. So default things cannot be accessed. Default, i.e. no access modifier. These things cannot be accessed by subclasses in different packages. Okay, protected things, on the other hand, they can be accessed by subclasses in different packages. So default is more restrictive than protected, but it's quite subtle, the difference. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. And that pretty much wraps up this section. All right, in this section, we are going to look at attributes. And by attributes, we mean things that you put inside an interface that are not methods. So here's an example. We've got a nested interface, A. It doesn't really matter that it's nested or not. It could have been this top level. This could have been an interface, actually. But in this interface, you've got string S equals the value S. It looks like a normal variable that you'd have at a class, like an instance level variable. But in actual fact, it's effectively a constant. And that's because by default, all the attributes inside interfaces are public static and final. So when you declare a constant, you normally say public, static, final, the type, the name of the variable, and then the value. But in interfaces, because all attributes are effectively public, static, final, you don't actually need to put those attributes in there. And when we do put them in there, they get grayed out. And the IDE says actually it's redundant because it's the default anyway. And so just the thing to bear in mind is if you see variables with values inside interfaces that are not in methods, they are effectively constants, not instance state. Okay, so interfaces cannot have states. That's the big difference between interfaces and abstract classes. Okay, in this section, we are going to look at the usage of interfaces. So that's this section here. So let's just minimize that. Be implemented more often than not. And we have an example interface here called air vehicle, which has one method called takeoff. And typically how we use this is we'd create a class that implements air vehicle and has to implement the functionality of the interface as described by the abstract methods here for you to take off as an abstract method in the air vehicle interface. And you've got like a dummy implementation here, which doesn't really do anything particularly useful, but you get the idea. Okay. And this override overrides this method over here. It's the same method, but it has the implementation details here. So one thing that's quite important to know is that you cannot create an instance of an interface when you're declaring it with the new keyword. So for example, if we do this, we get an error message because we're saying the reference type, which is this part here and the actual instance type, the concrete part is here. We're saying air vehicle A, this bit is fine because you can declare a reference type being an interface, that's absolutely fine. But the concrete part after the equals, the new, you can't say new air vehicle because air vehicle isn't a concrete thing that you can actually create an instance of. It's a definition of something that could be. So that won't work. But where we have the reference type as the interface, that's fine. And then we can say instead of air vehicle, we can say new airplane. And airplane, if we look at airplane, airplane implements air vehicle. Okay. So the 
Let's go back to that. So the reference type is the interface air vehicle and the part after the new is the actual concrete type. Okay, so this just kind of repeats the last point, which is that you can use interfaces as a reference type. So we've got another example here. You can ignore the generics part for now, but list is an interface and array list is a concrete implementation of list. So what does this give you using interfaces as reference types rather than just saying, let's say, array list. So this is also perfectly legal. Why wouldn't we just do this? What does using list, i.e. the interface, as the reference type, what does that give us? Well, what it means is that you can pass around references of the interface type. So your code is more flexible because you can swap out the implementations without needing to go ahead and change all that code. So we've got an example here where you've got just a fairly useless method here called print list, and it takes a list and it's kind of meant to print the list. And I just couldn't be bothered to actually implement that. But fundamentally, this is the important bit. It's a method that takes a list. It doesn't take an array list, it takes a list. And what this means is if we decide later on that we want a linked list instead of an array list or some other kind of list, we can just swap it out here and it doesn't affect any of the methods that get called with that actual list as long as they're still coded to the interface type. Your code is much more flexible and in many cases invisible. Sometimes clients might not even know unless they go ahead and check what kind of list they're getting back. They're just confident that it's a list because the method where they accept the value is of the interface type. And under the hood, it could be an array list. Later on, for performance reasons, it could be some other type of list. So it means that your code is much more flexible. And another thing to note is that you can implement an interface on the fly. So we have an example here of a method that takes air vehicle, which is the interface that we saw earlier. Okay, doesn't do, again, doesn't do anything particularly useful, but that's not the point. And we can implement this interface air vehicle on the fly. So we could use the aeroplane class that we've already created, which is an actual concrete instance, or we can implement it on the fly using this kind of syntax. Okay. Now notice here that we say new air vehicle. We're not actually saying new airplane or new hovercraft or I don't know, seaplane or whatever it is, or drone. We're actually just saying new air vehicle. So we define it on the fly. We don't give it a name. Hence, these are called anonymous classes and it's anonymous in that it doesn't have a name. And we just go ahead and implement this one method here. Now there's a reason why this code is grayed out because you can replace this with a lambda, but we'll come on to that in a second. So just to recap, what we've seen is that when you have something that takes an interface, if you don't have a concrete implementation of that interface and you don't really want to create one because you're only going to use it as a one-off, you can actually implement it on the fly using this kind of syntax. Now this can be replaced with a lambda. Lambda is this kind of funky syntax here, which hopefully you might be used to by now. And the reason why we can replace this with a lambda See, this is equivalent to this. The reason why we can do that is because this air vehicle is effectively a functional interface. And what that means is it's got one abstract method. Now, don't worry too much about functional interfaces for now. Suffice it to say that if it is a functional interface, instead of using the anonymous inner class type of implementation, you can just use a Lambda. But we've got a whole section shortly where we are going to cover functional interfaces, which is this section over here. Okay, in this section, we're going to look at naming, naming your interfaces. You have to give them a name when you create an interface. So for example, if we say interface animal, okay, that there is the name of the interface, obviously. Okay, and now we're going to look at some naming conventions for interfaces. So interfaces in general represent some kind of contract which will define some characteristics or a nature of something or an ability that implementing classes have if they implement that interface. Okay, so cat, for example, could be a nature. It's a type of something. Requires auth is a characteristic. So anything that implements this. So for example, if you had a system with lots of classes that represented different kinds of operations that you can do, so maybe some of those operations require auth to be allowed to do those. Okay, so requires auth is a type of characteristic. And so the names can include words such as is a, so for example, something is a trade. Anything that implements is a trade is a type of trade, obviously. You can have can, so something that represents an ability. So can go forward, can go back, like in a wizard type system that lets you build up information. Okay, you can have has or having. So for example, having metadata defines any implementing classes that they probably implement other interfaces as well. But if they implement having metadata, you can be sure that they have metadata. Requires, requiring, must, must have, those kinds of words are sometimes used. So requires requires admin permission, an example, with the suffix able, so deletable, or if some things, you know, maybe some data items or some beans can be deleted, they could be marked as deletable, another type of interface name. Sometimes you see prefix like I for interfaces, so instead of cat, you'd have iCat, 
In my opinion, I think it's best to avoid this. It's a kind of what they call Hungarian notation, where you try to describe what something is in the name. It's kind of technical characteristic. So cat defines what it is from a business perspective, but iCat is telling you that it's an interface. Now, if we take a look at this here, you can see the IDEs already tell you whether something is an interface or not. You get different kind of icons and other tools and things that can appear in the IDEs. But I personally think it's best to avoid that because like we said, that information is already provided by the IDE. I think secondly, it clutters up the code and clients often don't care. It won't immediately be apparent to them. So if they request a database connection, now if that database connection is of one type or the other, maybe one is cached, maybe one has got some other characteristics and it's swapped out. Maybe they don't care what the underlying object is as long as they get a connection back. So as long as you get a cat back, maybe you don't care that it's a British short hair cat or it's, a, I don't know, a Siamese cat or whatever. So it's just cluttering up the place. I personally would just avoid these prefixes. Okay, so here's just an example of an interface with all of those or most of those keywords in there. Okay, so a quick note while we're talking about naming, a quick note about default methods. So this isn't how we're going to name our default methods. This is just about how default methods are referred to if you're out there and you're reading documentation or reading articles. Default methods are sometimes called defender methods and sometimes they're also called virtual extension methods. I don't think you'll see it that often and I personally just call them default methods, but I just wanted to mention that in case you happen to see either defender or virtual extension methods mentioned in documentation. Okay, now in this section, we're going to look at implementing interfaces. Now, we've already seen some examples where we've implemented interfaces, and that's pretty much what it's all about. But we're going to go into it in a bit more detail now. So here we've got an example interface called can jump. That means anything that implements this has the ability to jump. We have a default method, a method where we've already provided the implementation, which just does something pretty pointless, but it's just for demonstration purposes. And then we've got an abstract method called big jump, which anything that implements can jump would have to implement themselves. So if we just look at a example class that implements this, now notice that it didn't need to implement the jump method because we have a default implementation. We can override it, but we chose not to, but we have to override the big jump abstract method and we have to implement that. So that's a straightforward class that implements an interface. One of the other things that we can do is, and it's not quite implementation, but it's just other ways that we can use it, is that we can create another interface called canfly, which extends can jump. And now in this case, it doesn't really actually define any methods, but you could define some methods here, which means that anything that can fly can also jump. So anything that implements can fly is effectively implementing can fly and can jump, and we'll have access to all of those methods. Abstract classes do not need to implement all abstract interface methods, or even in fact any of them. So you've got an example here of an abstract class called kangaroo, which implements can jump, the interface, but notice that it didn't implement the big jump method because it's abstract. And given that abstract classes are also abstract, they don't actually need to do that. And they can just pass that down to whichever class is going to implement it. But normally when you have an abstract class, you would at least have some state in there or some other method in there. So for this example, we don't. Okay, now looking at this class here, the duck class, this is an example of what I was talking about earlier, where we have an interface that extends another interface. Now, in this case, the duck class implements the can fly interface and can fly extends can jump. So in this case, it would get everything that is available on can jump and can fly, but because we don't have an actual method there. So let's just to make the example clear, let's just add in a method in here. Let's say void fly. And now we get an error here because we haven't implemented all the methods. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, and now we have a fly method. So because duck implements can fly and can fly extends can jump and provides one method of its own, you effectively get both. Okay, so that pretty much wraps up the implementing or extending section. Okay, in this section, we are gonna look at what you can put inside an interface. What can they hold? What can interfaces hold? So let's just minimize this. So first things first, we've already talked about the various types of methods. So now we're talking about what can you put in an interface other than methods, abstract, default, static, private methods. We've already talked about these. So this is about anything other than methods. So let's have a look at some examples. So inside an interface, you can declare a class. Now this is a static class. Everything here is static by default. So if I say static, it sort of gets grayed out because the ID is saying it's redundant. They're static anyway. You don't need to put that there. So we get rid of that. So you can declare a class in here. Now, why would you do that? That's probably the subject of another discussion, but sometimes from a design perspective, something makes sense within the context of the interface because you're kind of, I guess, your name spacing. You're just saying that logically this is part of something else, but that's probably a wider discussion. So anyway, you can declare a static nested class inside this interface. In the same way, you can declare a abstract 
class inside this interface as well. Okay, and you can declare another interface. So you can have an interface inside an interface. And this interface itself is inside a class just for whatever reason, I didn't actually make this an interface. So there's lots of nesting going on here. So that's all fine. That's all possible and legal from a compiler perspective. But what about static code blocks? Now, static code blocks are blocks of code that are by nature static. You can put them in classes. But what happens if we try and put one in an interface? So we get an error message saying not allowed in interface. Okay, pretty clear. So basically that's not allowed. We could go into more detail, but it's not allowed. We can't use it, so it doesn't really matter. The next thing is fields. So we've already talked about the fact that Abstract classes can have state, actual instance variables, and interfaces can't. Now, fields are a little bit different because when we say fields, we're sort of talking about constants in this case, right? So these are fixed values. They're not instant state because the state doesn't change. You're not tracking state over time. For example, the last dice that was rolled, what was the number that was rolled? That's a kind of state thing that changes and you're tracking the last one. These are more like fixed values, like an error message or an error code or the application name or something like that. So just to prove that, we've got a string s equals AAA, pretty useless. If we add static to it, the ID grays it out because it's not necessary. If we say static final, the ID grays it out because it's not necessary. If we say public static final, the ID grays it out because again, it's not necessary. So these are all effectively constants and they probably should be uppercase as is the convention for constants, but it doesn't really matter for the purposes of this discussion. So what about private uh, static final? What about private constants? Okay, let's try those and see what happens. So let's try private first and we get an error message because private constants are not allowed. And the more I think about it, you know, if you had multiple private methods in here, maybe private constants could be useful, but there's probably some reason for it that I'm missing or haven't thought about. So either way, they're not allowed. Okay, and let's try protected and protected in a similar way. It's not allowed. So essentially you can declare constants which are public inside the interface and that's absolutely fine, but you don't need all the boilerplate of saying public static final because they are by default public static and final. All right, so in this section, we are going to look at where we can declare interfaces. So the obvious one about where we can declare interfaces is at the top level. So let's take a look at an example here. So not very well named, but you get the idea. In the top level of a Java file, you can declare an interface similar to how you declare a class. So that's the obvious one. That's where most interfaces will live at the top level of a file. And that's fairly obvious. All right, so how about inside a class. So here we've got a class and inside there we've declared an interface. That's perfectly legal and perfectly fine. As you can see, that's allowed and working. Now, the thing to note here is that this is effectively static. If we declare another one and use the static keyword, so this is very similar to this, except that we've added the static keyword. Again, it's grayed out because it's not necessary because even this one is effectively static. So this is, think of it as a nested interface, not a inner interface. So that's absolutely fine. You can declare them there. Now, how about inside an inner class? So this is a top level class class and this is a inner class. It's not a static nested class, it's an inner class. There is a distinction. Don't worry about it too much for now, but let's just see if we can do that or not. And we can't, it doesn't allow it. So we get an error message saying static declarations in inner classes are not supported at the language level 11. I tried this in Java 15 as well. It's not allowed there either. So I don't know if that means that it may be allowed at some point in the future, but for now you can't do it. So if you've got an actual genuine inner class, like this one that's not static, you cannot declare interfaces inside there. So let's comment that out. How about inside a static nested class? So this one is an inner class and this one is what we call a nested class or a static nested class. And we won't go into a lot of detail what the difference between these two is. That's probably the subject of another presentation, but inner classes are more tied to the outer instance, to instances of this, whereas static classes are really just like declaring a class somewhere else, except that they're declared here, kind of namespaced, so you can understand that it's part of this wider class. And in this static nested class, we can declare an interface absolutely fine. No errors, no issues. And that is effectively static in there too. So if we add that, it just gets grayed out because it's meaningless. It's already static. So how about inside a method? Let's give that a go. I can't think why you'd want to, but let's try that anyway. And no, you can't. So local interfaces are not supported at language level 11. Again, hinting that maybe at some point in the future, they might be allowed from that error message. But for now, they're not. And I don't think I've ever had reason to declare one inside an interface. What about inside a static block? So remember, Java classes can have static blocks, which is just an unnamed piece of static code that loads, I think, when the class loads. Now, in that static block, we try and declare an interface. What happens? No, we're not allowed. Local interfaces are not supported. So yeah, a similar, similar kind of cryptic error message. Local interfaces are not supported at language level 11. Again, kind of hinting that they want to keep things open to potentially introduce them in the future. But for now, inside a static block in a class, you cannot declare an interface. Okay. Uh, how about inside another interface? So already this interface is in a class. Inside a class is declared inside this outer class. 
And inside that interface, we've declared another interface. And inside that one, we've declared another one. And you can probably keep going for quite a long time before you hit some kind of limit. Okay. And again, you probably don't want to go too far and declare some kind of crazy number of nested interfaces. But fundamentally, you can declare an interface inside an existing interface. Okay. So it's pretty flexible. Most of the time, you'll have top level interface like this, but maybe it's useful to know that you can declare them in a few other places as well. All right, so this section of the video is about design when it comes to interfaces. Now, I personally think this is probably the most important section of the entire video, design considerations when it comes to interfaces. It's not just about the mechanics of how you use them, but it's about when it's appropriate to use interfaces, when should you use them, what are the different reasons you might use them, all that kind of stuff. So let's get stuck in. So when to create an interface? Well, I tend to create them mainly when I have a bunch of sort of conditions, but also it becomes kind of intuitive after a while, but I've listed some of the reasons here. So. Reason one, when I want to treat a bunch of objects by some characteristic. So for example, I've got cars and boats, but I want to register them. So when you want to get a car or a boat on the road or in the water, I think you need to register them. Now I could create a registrable interface and have a register method. So let's take a look at an example. Okay, so I've got an interface called register with a register abstract method. I've got a car class that implements the registrable interface with the register method, which implements car. So it's different to the boat one. And other than that, the boat one is largely the same. So they both implement registrable and they have this common characteristic of register. So the common characteristic is extracted out into this interface. And then now it means that I've got a, say, a list of boats and cars. I can send them off to some register service and it's just a list of registrable items that doesn't care whether it's a boat or a car. So I can do that kind of thing because of this interface having that common characteristic. All right, so another scenario would be where I need to share some functionality across multiple classes. I can create an interface to hold that functionality, that common functionality. So let's have a look at example two. So example two is where we have a toy interface and it's got an abstract play method, but we've got a default initiate playtime method. Now this method isn't very well named because it talks about putting the toy away afterwards after playing with it, but it basically prints something out, you play with the toy and then you put the toy away. So that's initiate playtime. And that'll be the same for all implementers unless they override this. So you're providing some common functionality across all implementations. So let's have a look at a couple of implementations. So we've got a model car here, which implements toy and it has a play method it implements this play method here and we've got a play kitchen which also implements the play method okay so make dinner for example but they both inherit this common method here called initiate playtime so that functionality can be shared across all implementers by using an interface so that's another reason to use an interface okay so another scenario where i would use interfaces is where i want to have multiple implementations of something so for example i have a client that wants to fetch a connection from a service that i've built and then using that connection it might fetch some information or some data. Now I could return it a DB connection that implements the connection interface, or I could return it an SFTP connection or any other file system connection, any multitude of connections, maybe even a different database, some kind of other data store. But the client just receives the connection and doesn't really care about the underlying implementation. And what this allows me to do is to build new implementations and just swap them out at will when I want to provide a different type of implementation. Or maybe when the database is down, I can provide an SFTP connection. If the SFTP server is having problems, I could provide a different file system connection or some kind of other connection. Now, this technique can be used to hide implementation details from callers. They're not completely hidden, so it's not something that you use for necessarily for security purposes, but it means that you can hide unnecessary information from callers. They just interact with a connection, nice and simple. Under the hood, you've got different types of connections. Maybe some are cached, maybe some are faster. They provide different performance characteristics. And this technique allows a growing number of implementations to be used seamlessly. So over time, you could add other types of connections. So you might start off with these to and then over time add more as you come up with better algorithms or more optimized implementations. So if we look at example three, so here we've got a search engine example. So if I had a service and using that service, you can fetch a search engine. So I could just return to my client's search engine, which has a search method. But actually on day one, I might return an Elasticsearch search engine implementation, which is Elasticsearch provider, and that implements the search method. And on another day, because maybe the Elastic service is having problems, we can return the Ebrus search, right? Which is a Postgres database search. Now, as I said earlier, one of the advantages of this approach is that, say, for example, in future, we sign up with an AI search provider. So I can just have the AI search provider implement the search engine interface and seamlessly just return that to the client and that might return much better search results and we can just swap it out nice and easy.
All right, so another reason I might use interfaces is to allow composability and maintainability of some features that you can extract out into separate interfaces rather than having everything in one big class. So let's just have a look at an example of that. So if we look at this example here, we've got an account service which has to set up a new account for a customer. But in doing so, it needs to do some sort of checks and then it needs to go and create the account. So you could have all of these methods in this one account service and have like an account service interface of some type. But alternatively, if they don't require any state, you can have these methods separated out into different interfaces. So for example, you've got interface credit checks, which has checks pass. It's not a particularly useful method because it always returns true. So if you've got something which maybe a class which does a few things, one of the approaches you can take is to extract out the functionality that's slightly separate into different interfaces, providing those methods don't need access to any direct state. If they do need access to state, you could still implement an abstract method to fetch the state, but they don't hold any state themselves. And so here what we've done is that the account service needs to do some work related to credit checks and some work related to account creation. Now, both of the methods in this case don't require any state and we've extracted them out into separate interfaces. So what's the advantage of doing this? Well, one of the advantages of doing this is that if you have any problems associated with credit checks, you can get to the code very quickly because it's in a separate interface. It's not cluttered with lots of other things. If you have a problem with account creation, you can get to the account creation interface. And again, it's not cluttered with lots of things. It's an interface, so it inherently doesn't have any states. So you don't have to worry too much about that either. I find this quite nice and clean. That may be another example where I would use interfaces. Okay, and just a few other design considerations. So I personally prefer small interfaces. I don't like interfaces with, you know, hundreds and hundreds of methods. That's not to say they're wrong necessarily. It's just a personal preference. I prefer small composable interfaces. If it ends up with lots and lots of methods, I'd be really looking for a way ideally to split out into multiple interfaces. Just makes it easier to comprehend. Also, I would say consider providing default implementations where they make sense. So for example, we had in the initiate playtime method, this is a common default method. Now, obviously this can be overridden, but it kind of made sense to provide this default implementation, even though it does use an abstract method, which is absolutely fine. But in some cases it won't make sense. So in this play method, it wouldn't really make sense to have a default implementation because playing with different toys is completely different. Playing with a toy car is different to a toy kitchen or a basketball. It, so it wouldn't make sense here. But where it does make sense, even if some callers might override that method, it can be helpful to provide a default implementation. It means that somebody implementing your interface doesn't need to worry about implementing that if they're quite happy with the default implementation. Okay, that pretty much wraps up this section. All right, in this section, we are going to talk about abstract classes and why wouldn't we just use abstract classes instead of interfaces. So before we go into lots of detail, we probably need to explain what abstract classes are. Now, we're not going to go into a huge amount of detail about abstract classes. This is just a quick introduction so that we can talk about interfaces, but we'll touch on a few key details. The first thing is you can declare an abstract class with the abstract keyword before you say class. Don't be confused by the fact that this is inside a class. That's just for convenience. This could easily be at the top level here, and that would also be more common. I just declare it here for the sake of clarity. So with abstract classes, you can mix and match abstract and non-abstract methods. This is a non-abstract concrete method, and this is an abstract method, obviously, because it's got the word abstract there. You cannot instantiate abstract classes the way you can normal classes with the new keyword. Typically, you can't instantiate them because home is not something concrete. It's like an idea, a concept, a bit like an interface. You actually have to have an an implementing class like this guy here before you can actually concretely instantiate something. Now the methods, I'm just going to put here methods must use the abstract, I should say abstract methods should use and so let's say abstract methods must use the abstract keyword. Now, what does that mean? So this method here doesn't have an implementation. It's an abstract method. It means that the implementing class has to provide a concrete implementation like this one here. And in this case, we have to actually declare abstract. We have to say it's abstract. Whereas remember in interfaces, we never had to say that they're by default abstracts. And if you want to declare an implementation, you had to label it with default. It's kind of the opposite in abstract classes because when you declare an implementation method, you don't have to say default or anything like that. You just go ahead and declare it like a normal method. But when you want to declare an abstract method, you have to specifically say it's abstract. So it's kind of concrete by default. And then you have to label them as abstract if you want abstract. Whereas with interfaces, it's the opposite. They're abstract by default and you have to label them as default methods if you want to provide an implementation. Now, the main issue with abstract classes is that a class can only inherit from one abstract class. So you can't say extends home and extends something else. Well, I can't think of one now, but some other interface like abode or something. If we had another abstract class called abode, you're not able to also extend that one. You can only extend one home in this case. 
Whereas with interfaces, you can implement as many interfaces as you want. So you retain a lot more flexibility using interfaces. So this is what's meant by closing off the inheritance chain. Once you extend a one abstract class, you can't extend any more abstract classes, thereby closing off the inheritance chain, apart from, of course, interfaces. All right, so quick look at an actual abstract class plus an implementation. So we've got this abstract class called home, switch on electrics, which is a concrete method. And we've got one abstract method called the get the number of rooms. Then we can implement that using class my home extends home. So we use the extends keyword, not implements. That's quite an important detail. And then we just need to override the one abstract method to implement it. And we just return the number three. It's quite a simple implementation, but there's an example of a class extending an abstract class. Now there is another way to implement these on the fly, similar to how we saw with interfaces using an anonymous class. And here what we could do, imagine we have a method called X and it takes the home abstract class. So it takes something of type home and it doesn't do anything. So it's just for the purposes of demonstration, it doesn't do anything with that home for now. And um, when we'd normally pass that, we might create something like a my home and just send it through to that. So create my home, new my home. But instead of that, we can just extend it on the fly by saying new home. Now, what this does is says, okay, you're trying to create a new instance of home. So you have to actually create the overridden method, which is the same thing that we did here. So it's kind of like creating one of these, but without a name, hence anonymous, and it's created on the fly. Okay, so that's just another way of doing that. So what are the key differences? Then we're talking about abstract classes versus interfaces. So far, we've talked about some of the different default, all that kind of stuff. But one of the biggest differences is in fact state, instance state. Now instance state is an object inside an interface, which as you handle that instance, so for example, you've got my home, and as you, you might call various methods that builds up a state. Now that state, we've got an example here of state in an abstract class. So we've got this string builder message. Now string builder, you can keep appending things to it. Anything that implements messages, and you create an actual instance of it. So if you have a class called my messages that extends messages, okay, that will inherit this and that can start populating this, that instance, and that state will carry through. Now, when we have interfaces, we can try and create states, but as you can see by default, it's static because it's grayed out, which means that you could remove it, which means that the default is static and statics are once per JVM, once per class loaded in the JVM. It's not specific to your instance. So that means if you created an implementation of messages and created multiple instances, of those, they'd all be sharing this same messages object. So although it has state, that state is not tied to an instance, it's static. Whereas in the abstract class, it is actually tied to the instance. So what does that mean? Well, the conclusion is that we only want to use abstract classes where we need to hold state. If we simply want to access state, we can use a getter method. So let's look at some examples. So now we've got another abstract class called abstract messages. This has got some instance state here, and it's got an append method, which would append onto this message field. Now, an alternative to that is that we've got interface messages, which has a default void append method, which is similar to this because it's concrete. Oops. Now, when this wants to append onto the message instance state, it doesn't have it, right? Because you can't store instance state inside interfaces. So instead of that, it has to fetch it using something like a abstract method called get message. So it calls get message. Get message from the implementing class would return the state object. Here's an example. So we've got static class impl. Ignore the fact that it's static. We've got a class impl which implements interface messages, which is this interface here. And here we can store the state. OK, in the actual concrete class, but the interface method can still access the state by calling the get message. But the state itself is not held in the interface, whereas in the case of the abstract class, we had this state actually in the abstract class and it's inherited. So I hope that makes sense. Now, just to be clear, did we lie about state given that we've got an interface here with something that looks like state? But remember, as we said, this is static by default. So if I put the static keyword there, it should eventually, when the IDE catches up, it should be grayed out. Now take a look at this default method, which adds a score to this student exam scores map. As you can see, it's static, so it's grayed out, so it's not specific to the interface. Okay, let's get rid of that. So just to reiterate, it does store state, it can store state, but it's not instant state. The state only exists once per JVM because it's static. So I hope that makes sense. All right, in this section, we are going to look at functional interfaces. Now, these are interfaces which can be substituted with lambdas and method references. Now, these are all concepts around functional programming and functional programming in Java specifically. Functional programming is a much wider topic than this talk. So we'll just cover the details around functional interfaces, but definitely it's worth learning more about functional programming in Java. OK, so we can declare a functional interface with the app functional interface annotation. If I just click on that, you can find it here. And that marks this as 
a functional interface. Now, a functional interface can be a functional interface without this declaration. And what makes it a functional interface is that it has one abstract method. So it's an interface with one abstract method. Now, if we declare the functional interface annotation and then we add two methods to it, all of a sudden we get an error because of the annotation. It says, look, you've got multiple non overriding abstract methods in the interface, which is no good. So if it has one, then we're good. And that's a functional interface. Now, let's look at an example where we've got a method which takes a make something operation. So this is a functional interface and just think of it at the moment, just like an interface. So when you have an interface, you can pass in an implementing type of that interface. So if you've got like make a car and that implements make something, you could pass that in here and that'll be absolutely fine. And this would call the make method. But what we can do is pass something called a Lambda in. Now, if we have a look at, instead of saying make a car, we can implement this on the fly. Remember we talked about anonymous implementation. So this is an anonymous implementation of the make something interface. And in this anonymous implementation, which has no name, Name, but it's just like creating a class, really. It's just that it doesn't have a name and it can't be reused. So in this, we've got an operation which essentially prints out making a cake. Now, if make something was a non-functional interface, this would be how we'd have to pass this functionality down to this method, or we'd have to create an instance of like make cake something or whatever, right? We'd have to create a new class, a new implementing class, or we can do this. And it's pretty messy. It's pretty unpleasant. It's, it's quite verbose and it doesn't really get to the nub of what we're trying to express as a programmer. But given that this is a functional interface, i.e. it has this annotation, which is an, an essential characteristic of a functional interface, but it helps. And it's an interface and it's got one abstract method. Okay. And that allows us to use this kind of syntax, which is a lambda, which means that we can pass this piece of functionality in, making a simple cake, which is the same as the functionality we had here, but it's without all of this ceremony. Okay. Without all of this plumbing and ceremony. Okay. We don't need that. So we can just pass that in. But as I said earlier, the functional interface annotation is optional. Having it will force the compiler to check the remaining functional interface to see that there's no additional methods in there. So it's quite a good thing to add in. Plus it signals that in the future, people shouldn't start adding methods to that interface or abstract methods to that interface. So functional interfaces allow you to declare code, which can be substituted with lambdas and method references. Okay. Now don't worry if you don't know what method references are. Method references are just a kind of more concise way of writing lambdas. In some cases, some lambdas can be converted to method references. So what functional interfaces allow you to do is instead of writing this, remember, which takes a make something, the manufacturer method takes a make something. So instead of writing all of this, you can simply replace it with this. All right. In this brief section, we are going to look at something called annotations. Now, here's an example of me declaring an annotation. By declaring, I mean actually creating an annotation. So this is an annotation, a bit like how you declare a class or an interface or whatever. And you can see that we've got the at interface keyword. Okay. And here's an example of me using this annotation to decorate a field. Now, we're going to talk about annotations because they use the at interface keyword. But personally, I like to think of them as a separate topic. So we're not going to go into any real depth on annotations. And that would probably be a completely separate video on its own. We're just mentioning it here because of the use of the at interface keyword. So this is declaring an annotation and this is then using the annotation. And we don't really have much of a body here. You can declare fields here, variables, arguments to the annotation, but we haven't done that to keep this one simple. So annotations are used to decorate certain fields, methods, etc., where you want to mark them as something. And in many cases, you can have multiple annotations. Sometimes you can repeat annotations. They're a form of interface, but like I said, for simplicity, it's probably best to just think of them as annotations, not interfaces. And they're a whole topic on their own and they really should be covered separately. But just so you're aware, there is a thing called annotations. They use the at interface keyword when you're declaring them and they use the decorate fields, classes, etc. All right, folks. And that's a wrap. Now, if you made it this far, and obviously you have made it this far, that's why you're hearing this. I'm really impressed. I'm really impressed that you managed to sit through the entire presentation and hopefully take in some really useful information. So if you did find it useful, please do hit the thumbs up icon. That's really helpful. It tells the YouTube algorithm that this is actually useful content and it might be useful to other people. And don't forget to subscribe for similar content and hopefully better content in the future. Now, just quickly, I just want to say that we covered basically the basics of <laughs> interfaces, but we covered more than that. We went into quite a bit of debt, possibly more than you you really need to know at this stage. But the key thing to remember is that interfaces are a fundamental building block of Java. I'm just going to minimize this. 
a little bit of scroll going on there. And I think it's worth making sure that you really understand all those details, uh, the details that we've covered in this presentation before moving on to other topics, because interfaces, like I said, they're such a fundamental building block. You'll end up using them probably every day that you're coding with Java. And all of these things, all of this kind of presentations and coding and lectures and courses and stuff, it's really only useful when you actually go and put it into practice. So I would really highly recommend that you actually write some code, maybe a sample project or just, you know, make up a scenario and build a play fun project and use interfaces. That's the best way to cement your knowledge. So once again, thank you very much for listening to this presentation and I hope you find it useful. See you next time.